I might have said that. And we're live. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the episode two, actually also episode number 49 of The Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Marie Camisa, <laughs> Derek, Tam, and Scott. And we've just been singing Little Mermaid songs. You have just been singing Little Mermaid songs. There are other people in this room who are also singing them. Okay. You were in the theater when you watched that movie, weren't you? You said. I was. I haven't seen it since it was in the theater. You were 75 when the movie came out? Yes, I took my grandkids. <laughs> anyway, welcome back. Long time no see. It's been hours. Entire minutes. Um, have also, elapsed. I have a cappuccino. So by the end of this episode, <laughs> I will be speaking very quickly. We, uh, I guess we probably need a seatbelt for your chair to keep you in place. I mean, <laughs> just kind of fun i can do this oh we made it all through of two two episodes before you're using the adjustable it's a height it's a prop. Um, it needs to be used for this purpose what were we talking about last time we something were, that we're, we wanted to follow up on you were talking about um things with cars we're course, complaining about yes uh, oh yes mm -hmm. that's very on brand for us uh the topic was <laughs> why you should never buy and keep and collect a sedan Oh, how many, no. do you have cars? You do have cars with, with back doors. Um, <laughs> yes. I have a, a Cosworth Mercedes is a sedan, and mm -hmm. two of my 330s are sedans now. Mm -hmm. I don't usually do sedans. Could have fooled us. Well, three out of nine, it's practically barely a third. Right, and the wagon has back doors also, but it's not a sedan. Okay, okay. so underlying commentary here is that when I started in this industry, the dynamics of what was collectible were being driven primarily by uh, baby boomers and what baby boomers thought were cool was cool. Uh, and for that reason, there was never anything that had four doors that was collectible. It was just like, you don't do that if you're trying to make any money on a car, right? The stuff that is valuable is stuff like Cobras and I don't know, I guess later on it was Miuras. Miuras were not collectible yet when I, like as collectible. Can you imagine a world in which, I mean, Seriously, think about it. In a world in which a Mura is not a collectible car. I mean, yeah, they were like sort of 80000 Like, it cost less than a new Porsche Turbo. Um, it's still, okay, it's still a lot of money, though. I mean, for a normal person. Yes, but compared to what they're worth now, where they cost an order of magnitude more than a Porsche Turbo new, a new Porsche Turbo. Fair enough. Um, but still, I mean, 80000 bucks in the 1970s, 1980s, they were on in good the drugs. Which is in more, the 90s. In the 90s? In the 90s, yeah. Really? That's um, shocking. Yeah, so like, call it, let's see, 2000, uh, a Miura, a regular Miura was 100, and if you wanted an SV, it was 200. Uh, and so in the 90s, yeah, they were like 80 grand for a pretty decent car. That Which was like used Lamborghini money, right? That's the yeah. way that's, like, Murcielagos did never quite get that cheap. Countach's did, though, for mm -hmm. sure, especially the late ones, like, or the ones with, with flares and carburetors. Uh, Diablos kind of got down there, too. They were like under 100 grand for a while. But during that era, you know, if something had four doors, it was basically free. That was always the, the, the wisdom that was imparted to me was that don't waste your time collecting any car, especially a Mercedes with four doors. And in 90 mm, something, 95, 96, I bought a Mercedes 6.9 for 4,000 bucks. And, you know, that was a lot of money to me. And it was a hell of a lot of horsepower and a lot of performance and a whole lot of potential <laughs> disaster at the repair shop. But it was... Four thousand bucks for the fastest sedan in the world, I thought was a as a bargain, and everyone was like, "Don't waste your money; those things are never going to be worth any money." And they were right. Yeah, they're still not that valuable for what they are. For you know, for what they represented, six point threes. You mentioned last yeah. time six point nine. Six threes. I mean, yeah, a, a finest in the world, like fully restored to a conquer level, could maybe be a hundred grand, and like a very decent car is like fifty grand for six threes. Six nines are slightly less expensive than that. I mean, they sold 1,816, if I remember correctly, from 20 years ago, of them in the U.S. I mean, they were genuinely rare cars. 5,000 worldwide, I want to say. Mm, I would imagine a little more. They made 6,500 6 threes. They made 11,000 or 10,000 and change 500Es. So I bet 6 nines are in between. Well, it's perfect you mentioned the 500E because that's exactly where I was going to go. The, the, we are in the Haggerty Studio West where we film Revelations. And the most popular Revelations by a huge margin was the 500E on your car that you stupidly sold. Uh, we'll get, yes. get to that in All a second. that's true. But it's, it's, you know, it's approaching 3 million views for a, what is effectively a stand-up video where I talk about the back, the back history of the car, the backstory of the car. That is an expensive sedan now. Yeah, it is, yes. I mean, the, so I've had two of them. The first one I bought, 
I paid ten thousand eight hundred dollars for, which sounds like nothing now for how much those cars cost. Uh, but they became collectible, uh, and I think there's a bunch of other cars that have become collectible. I rattled off a few last episode. The E twenty eight M five. I mean, great E twenty eight M fives are north of a hundred thousand dollars now for low mileage um. examples. Um, but there has been a significant shift, and I think that that is at its core. Well, you, I know and you have a theory about this. At its core, I think it's driven by the fact that everybody wants the car that they wanted when they were young. And most baby boomers just didn't want sedans. There was no sedan that they truly lusted after in, in their youth. I think that's for a number of reasons. And I think one of my theories on this is because at that point in the history of the cars, when baby boomers were young, it, the sedans weren't that great. The sedans were sedans and the sports cars were truly special. You didn't have V12 sedans. You had V12 sports cars, though. Yeah. You didn't have hot rod sedans. You had hot rod coupes. Well, that's why I think the impact of the 6.3 is so significant. And that was one of the things that I talked about in my video. But I guess that all of the people who would have dr would drive the values of cars from that era, which would be baby boomers, because mm -hmm. all the stuff from the 60s, you know, those exploded in value, call it 20 years ago. That was when Ferrari Daytonas and 330 GTCs and 73 Carrera RSs and all that stuff started getting expensive and it was driven by those guys and they weren't really l lusting after 6.3s mm -hmm. whereas people because, because they didn't know about it i mean 6.3 is the right recipe right it is a hot rod sedan is it just because those boomers didn't know that hey you can have a sedan that's usable that fits five people or you know shit in the trunk um and has the ex uh, driving experience of a coupe or at the risk of shitting on baby boomers um such as myself. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> earlier than Baby Boomer. Yeah, older than that. Uh, um, I think they didn't have the vision uh, or the open-mindedness, right? Like there's this great quote from Car and Driver. When I was doing research on the 330 GTC, I was reading a 1965 issue of Car and Driver in which they tested the 330 GT 2 plus 2 against the Pontiac, I think it was a GTO, uh, because they were like, they're both fast, they're both four-door or four-seaters, they're both like sort of GT-type cars. And I'm going to paraphrase the quote here, but it basically, they said, if the Ferrari were a woman, uh, she would be about 35, uh, athletic figure, sad eyes, um, a terrible cook, and great in bed. And if the Pontiac were a woman, she would have the pretty but empty face of an airline stewardess and <laughs> be uninspired in both the bedroom and uh, the kitchen. And all of your friends would think you were the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, that's basically something that was published in a car <laughs> magazine in 1965. Uh, and so these are like the, the signals, right? These are the messages that car enthusiasts, young teenagers, right, who are reading car magazines, who were born in 1950 and are 15 in 1965 reading car magazine. These are the messages that they're getting about A, women and B, cars. Uh, and oh, so I think shit. that that mindset is probably, you know, what I'm trying to say is that mentalities have shifted a lot in the ensuing 50 years. Yeah, thank God. Uh, 55, almost 60 years. Uh, if I did that math right. Anyway, uh, right in the ensuing decades, mentalities have shifted a lot uh, about women and about sedans. Uh, and so I think that they just aren't of the mind that, you know, it's something like with four doors that looks sort of upright and square rigged and not and is kind of a sleeper mm -hmm. is something to be desired. Mm. Uh, and I think that we that, that in the ensuing years, there have been cars that have demonstrated that. I mean, it helps that the 190E Cosworth made its sort of big PR debut at the Nürburgring being driven by a bunch of a current Formula One drivers and B also like former, you know, world Legends. champions. Yeah. So like Sterling Moss, I think was driving mm -hmm. one, Ayrton Senna. Supposedly that Ayrton Senna Lauda put him on the map, uh, put Ayrton Senna on the right. map. This is, I love this story. You should, should you, you should try to tell you should it. You should do it. I mean, Ayrton said it. So the, the opening, the grand opening of the Nürburgring GP circuit, the new Nürburgring, not mm -hmm. the Nordschleife, right. happened in 83, 84. Yeah, so, yeah I think it, this, well, this race, I think, occurred in 84. Right. So this was the first race, and Mercedes, as a publicity stunt, set up a race of, I think it was 20 identical 2.316s, all driven by legends in the... Uh, in or the current driver. F1 drivers. Yeah. One of whom was Ayrton Senna, who was not a legend at that point. He was. He was like a fucking new. Oh, really? Oh no, he pinch hit for what's the dude's name? Who uh, uh, sex and breakfast? Um, oh, uh, James Hunt. Hunt. James Hunt. I'm, I think it was Hunt. It was really? one of them was he out was still drinking. Still around in '84. 
I feel like he had he already was. burned out. Anyway, in any case, I didn't know this It was part. someone else. Someone else was out drinking whatever and didn't show up in the morning. And so they put Senna in. If I, this is God, so long ago that I read this all this stuff. But Senna was like just, okay, this new guy. And he was dead set on winning the race to show all these guys that he knew what he was doing. Yeah, so he's out there with Niki Lauda and, you know, whomever else is out yeah. there racing. And a, and a bunch of the other guys were, if you watch the footage, which is we should throw a link in, in somewhere. There's, it is epic. It's epic. Because there are, there are a bunch of other, you know, Formula One greats and, you know, driving greats who were just moving and then there was lauda and senna and they were fucking going for it i mean hopping curbs and just absolutely trying to destroy these cars a couple of cars did get damaged mm -hmm. um but you watch the footage and it looks sped up i mean they're in the rain four and they're like drifts. drifting fully mm -hmm. in the rain um and aaron senna won and that yes. was you know that was actually it was ferrari boss was at the race saw that and said okay let me go talk to that guy um so that really you know got him noticed the As world if, took notice. Yeah. And then, of course, we know what happened after that, which is he became one of the most legendary drivers of all time before right. tragically losing his life. But all that to say that this, the backstory of the, of the sedan, of that sedan, and of others, I think, in the ensuing decades have changed people's mindsets about what collectability is. And so you look at, like, Evo 2 Cosworths, and they made 500 of those, and those are, f for a good one, over $400,000 oh, now. Way over. But here's a question. So E30 M3 was, was obviously, we have to clear this up. <laughs> Because there will there will be people who are like, me, 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 30 M3 was first. 2316 came in 1983. Uh, the M3, E30 M3 was 1987. So it was three to four years later. Um, do you think the E30 M3 would be worth more or less if it were a four-door? I think it's immaterial. That's an interesting point. Because I think E30s overall, you know, we have, you have coupe, sedan, wagon, and convertible. And strangely, of all of them, the highest prices I've seen have been convertibles, which I do not understand. I have but, not seen that. I'm surprised to hear that. I would have expected a coupe 325 IS to be the So a big valuable. bumper 325 IS or a little bumper 325 The, the, the later ones. The later like ones. Like 89 and up. I'm not sure it really much matters. I and mean, that's the weird thing about E30s. I'm not sure it actually matters whether they're coupe, coupe or sedan. I think touring is a different market. And obviously convertibles are just a different car. I mean, it's a, they drive very differently and they're very heavy and very flexy and very cruisy rather mm. than squirty but anyway the, just interesting because the 2316 was a sedan and the e30 m3 was obviously coupe only and i just i wonder if it would have affected everyone's impression of that car if it was a four-door yeah the 190e was the alpha julia of its day in the sense that it was only offered in one body style right whereas everybody like bmw has had, had a proliferation mm -hmm. albeit somewhat accidentally with the introduction of the wagon version of that car yeah the wagon version of the e30 but the m3 was obviously only uh, coupe. was coupe and then you know for the for the next generation obviously e36 was all of those all four body styles again but e36 m3 was both three body styles coupe sedan and convertible they learned their lesson um anyway so all right so back to 1960 so, something when you were an old man no i have nothing further to add about the 60s other than i just think that that buyers who lusted after cars of that era are not uh conditioned to desire a sedan in the same way that uh people who are from generation x and newer are so one of the other biggest factors in in collectability and value of a car is always scarcity right how few were made and this one factors into 500e because 500e was not a high volume car but all of its mechanicals were effectively identical in the r129 sl 500 and 500 sl and you sold your 500e to get a 500 sl um it the 500 sl was a consolation prize effectively i would have preferred to keep the 500e but i wanted the money out of it for something else uh, and so the way that i came to terms with that decision was to buy a 500 sl and get substantially the same car for a tenth eh, maybe not a tenth a fifth of the money Right. Uh, and so that's an unusual one because, well, I guess, like you said, it's value scarcity. So they built a lot more SLs than they made of, of, uh, 500 Ds. Yeah. So, but I wonder if it's so 500 L uh, the, the R129, I think is hopelessly undervalued. I, mean, I agree. It's such 100%. an incredible car and I don't own one. So I don't, I'm not, unlike you, I don't stand to profit from this conversation, um, <laughs> but, yeah, so uh, it'll go from being worth $20 to $25. Four, that's quite a percentage in, improvement, but I really think I can't. I don't know if I can wrap my head around a world in which a nice 500D is now $100,000 and a nice 500 SL is 20, 25. Yeah, 20, for an early car, like 15 should get you actually a pretty nice car. It's kind of shocking. It's really shocking. Okay, you really want to blow your mind in terms of sedans that are valuable. So the AMG Hammer. So everybody mis 
let's clear this up. Everybody misidentifies or mischaracterizes the 500E as a hammer. It's not. The hammer is an altogether different car. That name should not be applied to anything except for the AM, pre-merger AMG cars, which uh, were built in the late 80s and you know famously competed in the world's fastest car thing along with the Countach and the Testarossa or whatever, F40. I forget what else was in there, 959. Mm. It was on the cover of Road and Track in like 1987. And the the AMG Hammer, the actual one, uh, they made, I don't know, there's probably like a dozen of them that came to the U.S. that were built by AMG Nor- or Ford AMG North America. Those cars now, any thought on what that might be, what those things are worth? They have to be worth a lot. I mean, the 500E and all of the all of the other high-performance sedans are going to pull that value up, first of all. Second, scarcity, right? This is not when AMG was a division or a brand or just a different model. I mean, you know, you can get an AMG A-Class front-wheel drive car. Um, this was actually a tuner that took the cars and was in bed with the with Mercedes in racing. So it was a real, genuinely different thing. It was an M1, what was that name? 116, that motor? That 17. V8, 17, because it was aluminum four block. cam head. Had that AMG made. Yes. That's insane. Yes. I mean, they took a single overhead cam, two valve per cylinder motor, and made their own twin cam twin cam heads for it which mercedes then did and went racing with a few years later yeah. for the uh, c9 for the salber right. c9 which is nuts yeah and that be- comprehensively re-engineered right. also another fun fact coefficient of drag of the hammer is like 0. 0.26 point two nothing i mean it's nothing um which they did by sort of under trays and a pillar fillets and a bunch of other stuff i guess to those cars anyway genuine that's, that's why they were so fast uh, so they were wildly expensive. Like it cost more than a Testarossa new. They were super rare because who was going to spend that kind of money on a sedan, especially because everybody who had money to buy those cars back then were up, were the people who were teenagers in the 60s. And they're like, I'm not going to spend that kind of money for a fast sedan. That, that looks, looks like, like every nothing. other fast looks sedan. Like a, yeah. Or it looks like there are no fast sedans. It right. looks like a sedan. It looks like a taxi. It looks like a taxi. Yeah. Um, so, so what are they worth now today? I don't know. I mean, it's got to be. So and- yeah, five hundred E is a hundred grand. The five, this AMG post merge or like or, or the five hundred E six point oh. Those are like two hundred grand. Um, Jesus. One ninety Cosworth Evo twos are like four hundred. A good hammer is above five hundred. Get out. Above five hundred. Yeah, like it could be like six seven hundred. So what's a hammer, hammer wagon worth? Then? I don't know. There are two here holy shit no idea i mean find another one that's yes. i think scarcity again find another one right i mean and also because there was only a dozen of them made right you only have to find a dozen people who think it's worth that much whereas you know if there's thousands of them thousands of 500 e's uh, and then there's, there's another thing that drives value like you said scarcity either rarity when they were built in the first place or rarity now and of course so many 500 e's got used up the same thing happened with all variants of m5s because all the guys who are not wanting to put miles on their Ferraris or Porsches because the weekend car going to both still want to have a, an enjoyable daily drive. Uh, those guys will all have used 500 E's and M5s as daily transport. So they're all floating around with 300,000 miles on them. So when you find one now that has 26,000 miles, it's like, holy crap, find another. Right. And then we have the next factor, which is the bring a trailer factor. So it's, it's, it's exposure, right? You have all you said a minute ago. All you have, to, all it takes is find two people who want that car, and or twelve people that want that car, and now they're all in the same room because we're on the internet. They're not yeah. at some auction that they didn't know about in some obscure town somewhere. They're all in the auction. They're all in the room, and pff, values go through the roof. Yeah, because a lot of people are like, "This one's here. It's available now." Like, I just don't. I'm tired of looking. Mm-hmm. This seems good enough. All these other people seem to think it's worth this much also, so I'm willing to spend that much. And then, of course, there's a little bit of like gamesmanship and the public audience thing that happens in all auctions So do you think uh, th- as well. Do you think that the... Inf- so, I mean, there, there are a ton of people that I'm talking to that, all, that think the classic car market is totally inflated, to which I say, well, if modern cars were that good, classic cars wouldn't be worth this much, frankly. I and mean, that's, my, that's my canned response. Do you think it's a permanent thing? Or do you think, think it's a temporary phenomenon because all of a sudden everyone's in the same room thanks to the Bring a Trailer and company, right? The sort of online auction places. So one of the things that I think about to answer that question is it's got to be macroeconomic, right? In some sense, you have to have a large enough number of people who have a bunch of money to drive these factors, there's there's a bunch of people who have a bunch of money right now. If all of a lot of those people disappear, call it like 2008, right? When there's a big dislocating economic activity or or event that occurs that removes wealth for a lot of people, then there's just the values have to go down because there's fewer people who are able to participate in that. Barring that, or aside from that 
possibility, which is very real. Uh, I think that the values are probably sustainable, certainly for the near term. I'm continuously heartened by what I see from young people when I go to car events. Um, there was definitely concern when I started doing this 15 years ago that enthusiasm for an interest in cars was just going to completely disappear from the next generation. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were a bunch of people who were like, all these kids these days are just playing video games and blah, blah, blah. Do you know where all this came from, by the way? Because I still hear people quote this study. There was one study, and I don't remember who did it, but it was a study that asked people, past kids, that if they had to decide between an internet connection or a car, which would they choose? All right. You can ask people really bad and misleading questions, and that is that's a fundamental mechanical issue with the study, and that was it. What a dumb fucking question. Would you like air or would you like your car? Breaking news, 99.6% of kids say they would rather not have a car. They would rather choose to breathe. Of course. that. I mean, what they didn't realize at the time, the designers of that study who were fucking inbred, obviously, didn't realize that the internet isn't just a thing that you can play with. This is like electricity or water. It's something that allows modern society to function. You can't ask someone, would you rather have that or a toy? Obviously, we know what's going to require. That's where all that came from. So when I started in this industry, also 15 years ago, all we heard was, oh, the younger generation is not interested in driving. It was all because of that one fucking study written by morons. Um, and I hope they're listening to this or their fucking children are and so they can curse their dead parents or whoever wrote that study. Um, because it really informed a whole generation of people who thought, I'm the only one. There's no one else is interested in cars. And then they come to a Cars and Coffee and realize everyone who's there is in their 20s and they all like the same shit and they're really cool. It just put the whole sort of movement of car enthusiasts back by 10 years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more strongly. And then, of course, the type of car enthusiasm that we have now is different from the vision that these people who were sort of running around saying the sky was falling 20 years ago. But that's okay. I think that progress is natural and that people are going to gravitate towards what is relevant to them. And for that reason, you know, people who are interested in cars from the 80s may not get the excitement around, I don't know, choose an example. Is it LFA? Is it 458? I it? don't know. I mean, the thing is, you know, you sort of, everyone always says you see this sort of moving window of like a 20 year period that, you know, 20 years back was with the cars that have the most value. I think there are a lot of them that have defied that trend. 60s cars and 70s cars that have really stayed up in value and haven't really yeah. fallen. I guess, you know, maybe look, it's 20s and 30s cars now that no one really gives a fuck about. But the part of that is usability. I was going to say that. And this is one of yeah. these trends that I'm seeing in the car industry or in the car enthusiasm industry that I'm really delighted by is that. People are interested in what I think in academia is called instrumental value, and which is to say the value of the object as an instrument to do things, mm -hmm. right? If you certain things where you look at the value of like, I don't know, Ferrari 250 GTO is worth $60 million. That's not because of its instrumental value. Its value as a tool to do stuff is in the order of hundreds of thousands or maybe like a million dollars. You know? Is it really? I don't know. I don't know. I would pay a million dollars to go to have something that would take me to get food when I was, if I were starving to death. Okay. Um, that is not. <laughs> so the instrumental value of this car, so, so a huge portion of the car's value is not instrumental. It's right. not about its value at doing stuff. It's its value as a cultural artifact, as the ultimate expression of the ultimate era of the ultimate manufacturer in motorsports of whatever the fuck. Right. Um, and so that was started out very coherent and rapidly deteriorated into you started to make sense right at the end like i didn't know what the fuck you were talking about until you said whatever the fuck now i know um so the value of that car is not about what it can actually do and what i'm seeing and so the way that i got to this point or this comment is that i'm seeing people who are buying things and driving values on the basis of what they can do with them and people want to use these cars and so whether it's you know cars and coffee is a minimal thing or going rallying or some kind of situation where you're actually using the car mm -hmm. Because uh, there's so many collectors who, you know, these cars kind of disappear where they just end up in private collections and don't get seen or they end up on the lawn at Pebble Beach and nobody gets exposed to them or, or whatever it is. But I see that value trends and sort of what is hot and and what people are seeking the, uh, in the market is driven a lot by how you can use it. And that's the problem with cars from the 20s and 30s right. is that they're hard to use now for the average person who is interested in cars. It's hard to cross that chasm because there's a big step I mean, even between 1939 and 1929, there is a big sort of discrete step in usability of cars. That I, don't, 
But yeah, I don't think we could really get to the point until the 80s. The post malaise cars, I think, is where we finally have the, car, the point where these cars are genuinely usable in traffic. I mean, they keep up with traffic. They can, you know, they can drive at the, the speeds that we drive at, but are also reliable enough to do that where you're not scared to risk it. Because even 60s cars, yes. oh, it's hot out. I can't take the car out because it's going to overheat. And yeah, so a lot 60s especially. cars, if it was an expensive, high-performance car, and this is the thing about the going that, to me, makes it so transcendent, is that despite it being from the 50s, you can effectively use it like a modern car. Uh, and it's just performance. I mean, like performance-wise, what is it? It's seven seconds to 60? I mean, it's quick. Yeah, so what is that? It's slight, It's behind like a first-generation M5 for mm-hmm. sure. It's, uh, mm, I think about those cars is they start, they run, they idle, they don't overheat. You can get parts for you them. You can get parts for them. They're just, they're real things where yeah. you, you know... The comparison we can always make is the Mura, yep. which is just a very any different. Type. Yeah, I mean, I've never tried to daily any drive uh, to E type or sit in traffic on a hot day in any type, but I suspect, given my experiences with seventies and eighties Jaguars, <laughs> it will not end well. Yes, they are actually possible to sort. You have to change a few things, and then you can actually get them to that point. Mm-hmm. And it's never going to be to the point of an eighties Mercedes Benz, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, you can make it so that's livable. Uh, but yes, the point is that something that is, is usable. And so for me, like it, for a special occasion car, I'm okay with low uptime. Are you though? Not if it's seven figures. Okay. If the car is right. cheap enough, right? It has to be at the right situation where you're like, okay, this is a number of dollars where I'm okay spending this on a toy that doesn't have a lot of uptime, but I get periodic enjoyment out of. You say that though, but all of the cars that have been high maintenance and broke a lot, it doesn't matter how cheap they were. They went, you fucking sold them. Because your point was, I'm paying insurance, I'm paying upkeep, I got to pay to repair these friggin' things, and I don't get to enjoy them to that whatever stanford bullshit you were talking about, about instrumental, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, that's the thing, is you want to drive your cars. Yes. And if, if they're down three quarters of the time, or if every single time you drive it, it's got to go into the shop for something, no fun. It's not doing its job. Right. Yeah. So the cars from the 60s are potentially able to do that. It also depends on how mechanically inclined you are, and it depends on how often you're trying to use it and however many other cars you may or may not have. If it's like your second car and you're trying to, and it's from the 60s and you're trying to use it a lot, then it's yeah potentially quite problematic. Uh, so yeah, that's what has driven, the I think, the, the, the dynamic with cars from the 30s is becoming irrelevant. It's, uh, to some extent, cars from the 60s, simple cars from the 60s seem to do okay. Trucks, Broncos, I mean, look at Broncos. Those have gotten valuable. They're simple. Mm-hmm. They're pretty robust. They're easy to live with. Parts availability is great. They're usable. Yeah. Right? They're usable, usable in, in some of, sense. Right. As long as you don't want to go on a highway and stay right side up. Yeah, but it's not usable but not usable for a road trip, but it's usable for, you know, put your family in, you know, especially the convertible the ones beach. and just go yeah. down to the beach or keep one at the lake house to tow the boat down. And that's a use case where you have something that's a piece of art and a cultural thing, but also can get you somewhere. Um, to your point. The whole coupe versus sedan thing is strange to me. Uh, I never understood why they they just didn't do well. And Anthony, our director, just brought up a, something a couple minutes ago. He has a Quattro Porte. Uh, five. Five. A good one. A beautiful one. I would have one, uh, three, and five. Only odd number Quattro Porte. There was no two, really, was there? No, they made it like a half a dozen of them. Uh, yeah. They were, uh, I think they were stretched um, Maserati SM. Mm, really? Uh, Citroen SM Citroen. in Maserati drag. That's with four bizarre. doors. I think they made like half a dozen of those. Okay. And then and four anyway, we didn't get here. But that four was a we didn't get car. here is a Gandini car, but it looks like a bi-turbo kind of. It's not a problem. Bi-turbos were good looking. I think the they right did. ones are good looking. Like they I didn't. think that the the Ghibli's, the Ghibli bi-turbo is pretty cool looking. I think there's something slightly awkward proportionally about it's a Gandini the car. Four. Everything Gandini's ever done is slightly awkward or Kuntash? completely awkward. <laughs> Defines awkward. I don't think it's awkward. Really? Did you, have you seen the the? I don't think the mirror is awkward either. No, the, no. But he hadn't. I don't think he had fully hit his stride yet. Yes. There's nothing weird awkward. about the mirror, right? Every other car that Ganini's done has just something that's a little like yeah. just a little off. Um, it's part of what In makes a charming this car great. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, yeah Quattroporte Five, Quattroporte Five GTS, loud as fuck, makes all kinds of noises. It's white, which I hate, but you know. He's across the room, and if you see something flying at me, um, as he would say, find another one. So there's that. So it's, it's a Quattroporte GTS, and it is 
comparatively compared to a with the right transmission with the right transmission well it's not really the right transmission the right transmission would have been a manual but that wasn't available um, yes but it's they 5 hp it 5 hp 6 hp 6 6 um yeah so 6 speed zf transmission but compare that to the gran turismo the coupe which i would so much rather not own i, I, I like qp5 i've always wanted one right same here but the gran turismo i hate i think right. it's just what is the point of a car that's the size of a house that you can't fit anything in? Like, I don't like big coupes. I just don't. Yeah, it to me, it strikes me as like an old white guy car. Yeah, it's a, it's a Toyota Solara with a Maserati badge on it. Yeah, it's the same person who buys the SLs I don't like or Lexus SCs. SLs or, I don't like. Ooh, that's a whole episode concept. The SLs I don't like. We've talked about this. Yeah, but it's We all, all together skipped the R230 in our SL episode. <laughs> we did like a whole episode about the SL and talked about every generation in succession. And then we were like, there's the R230. Moving on. We And I did a, an episode on every generation of SL when we were at Motor Trend and, and didn't mention the 230. <laughs> like it wasn't even there. We just couldn't find did, one. We didn't try. Who cares? <laughs> it's fucking hideous. <laughs> but no, that, 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 there's not, dynamically that Gran Turismo is amazing. Like you get that on a bumpy, twisty back road, and they meant it when they called it Skyhook. That suspension, it was really good. <clears throat> Don't care. Give me a Quattroporte. So, like, are we the anti baby boomers? Like, are we? Do we value the sedan more than the coupe just because we like the fact that it's a sedan and it's not showy? Uh, I like value for money, and so if I can get an experience for less money that's comparable uh, and or more utility. There's something to be said for that. So at price parity, you, does that make the Quattroporte less desirable than a GT, Gran Turismo? If they cost the same, I would buy a Quattroporte. If, what if the Quattroporte costs twice as much as the Gran Turismo? So opposite of how it is now. Uh, well. What's your answer? Quattroporte. I, the thing is, I don't want, it doesn't matter what the price is. I have no interest in a Gran Turismo. Yeah. No, you're all. right. You're right. 100% true. Okay. But a like Porte, I don't really care about the back seat. I mean, yes, it's great to have that. It's a nice back seat, huge trunk, like 14 dead hookers in the back. Doesn't matter. What I want is that it, the looks of it and the experience. And I just wonder if now, if we're saying that the 1960s where people were taught that, you know, you don't have a sedan and you do go after the lusty looking coupe, were we taught mm, E30 is the right thing to do? You know, three box. Oh, look how box. three boxy it is. Yeah. I kind of wonder about that because all the cars that I lusted after, like I'm fucking weird, but I wanted a Peugeot 405 MI16. Like I'm that was very, European car. I'm of pretty the year. varied though. There's stuff that I mean, like I like full spectrum. Do you? Hold on, now I got to poke it. Like, yeah, like 512TR or like 911 or Ferrari 275 or. Would you own, really own any of those cars? I mean, 911, obviously, yes. If I could afford a 275, absolutely. If I could if I had could afford it and I could only buy one Ferrari, then I would buy a 275 GTB4. Interesting. And then like F40. Would you have an F40 or a 288 GTO? Same powertrain. I'd have the F40. I would have the 288. We could race. I would have the F40. <laughs> I, there's so, but there's a trick that the F40 does that I think makes it a lot like some of these really cool sedans, right? The the thing that's cool about these sedans, like the 190 Cosworth, for example, is that it looks very upright and it looks very sort of conservative, and you don't expect it to be that athletic, and you don't expect it to have the balance and sort of enjoyment that you get out of hustling that car at the limit. The F40 is kind of like that too, because you open the door and you're like, wow, it's like plastic and or composite, and there's no, it's painted, and there's no upholstery on it. The dashboard's trimmed in Velcro, and there's no carpets, and it's just like bare carpet. Velcro? I thought that was sort of it's, reconstituted it's, shit. It's a shit it's, box. It's Perlon, I think. It looks like this. There's the material that Porsche saw fit to trim their trunks with yes. in the lightweight cars <laughs> only. If I you said, didn't get the I, lightweight car, you got nicer carpet. But the, I had to say that just because it's fun to shit on a F40. <laughs> um, but but that's the thing about the car. It looks so elemental. The, right. the, when I drove one for the first time, I was like, man, this thing's going to be like just really intimidating and really intense and really gnarly. And you get in and drive it, and it's a sweetheart. Off really? like off boost, it's really like it's not boring. But the, it's just you. You have this Sedate, expectation right? that it's going to be really like unusably um, cantankerous. Yeah, just race cary, mm -hmm. and it's not like that at all. I thought uh, the same about so, the two eight eight. Yeah, and so I really liked that about the mm. car is that when you haul, like it's wonderful. Like it, 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 you can. It's one of the only Ferraris of that era that you can drive like a nine eleven in the sense that you can take it, you know, drive it hard and ask a lot from it, and it doesn't start to break down uh, dynamically. Yeah. So 288 was the same way. So I drove a 288 GTO last last year at um, 
car week. Car week. And I came out, I blew my mind because every Ferrari I've ever driven has been a disappointment in sort of part. This is expectation setting, right? This is my expectations of my dream of what I thought a Ferrari was going to drive like. And the Testarossa was like the biggest joke of my life. Like I, I was like, look at this. It's got side strikes. It's a flat 12. It's this and whatever. I hate and hated it i so i like how it drives but you have to divorce it from how it looks ding ding exactly i had to it wasn't it wasn't until the second or third time i drove one where i'm like yeah it drives like a big seven series with a with a yeah. v12 in it and then you get in you're like this is a really nice car but then you drive a 512 tr and you realize that is how it was supposed to have driven in the first place yes and fuck the tester us so anyways yes. but 288 gto i got in and i'm like okay this is going to be brutal it's gonna yeah. it's not gonna want to idle it's gonna be miserable it's gonna be slow and boosty and laggy in the way of like a 930 which is not a good way and the steering is gonna be shit and it's gonna bottom out on everything and it's gonna crash into the bump stops and it was fucking magic just absolute magic yeah yeah so i would have and if the f40 is anything i've not driven an f40 so if, if it's anything like that then i can yeah it has a lot of the same attributes it has this this sort of it's rewarding in all the right ways and it's not an ass pain in all the right ways mm. Countach's can be an ass pain in some of the wrong ways i still really like them and mm -hmm. i would still very much own a Countach, but they can be a pain in the ass in a lot of sort of ways in terms of just trying to use the car specifically like the weight of the controls the shift <laughs> effort is just insane you're just like is this for real like is this car broken um and you know, seeing out of it is also very difficult. That it, it steering's heavy at low speeds, but it, once you're moving, it's fine. Sure. Um, so, but yeah, the, the F40 is tough in all the right ways and easy in all the right ways. So it's interesting. You were talking about the F40, and I, I, it made me think of another car that doesn't drive like it looks. It's another car that looks like it would be aggressive and sporty, and then it's not at all. E31 seven, uh, eight series. I've never driven an E31. Oh, get out. Okay, then we can't. We're gonna have to hold this conversation because that's another car where it's a complete mismatch. I mean, uh, I have to imagine it looks like a drive. It looks like a big GT. Like, does it not? It's not like to a me, seven series. To me, it looked like a five fifty. Like it. It looked Marinello. Like it looked like it. it or uh, Marinello looks like it. Or, okay, same thing. But it's sort of. It speaking. looks. It looks very much like. It's the like Ferrari GT. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so quintessential like front engine. Uh, sports car sports car sports gt with uh, a to me two. it's like an s-class coupe well, unfortunately you're closer that's closer to how it drives because the seven series of the day was a dynamic masterpiece i mean they were just they were really really good to drive for a sedan and in my mind i had that you know pre having driven a testarossa for example i thought ferrari front engine v12s were going to be nuts or you know any of the v12s were going to be nuts to drive turns out they're not and it was the same disappointment with an E31 because it's quiet and sedate. It's actually very slow. I mean, they're really quick instrumented test-wise, but they just don't respond and the transmission won't shift. And it's Yeah, just, it's mm. a car for old rich people. It's the thing yeah. you were talking about before about not liking big coupes because they tend to, the experience that comes with a car that's built for an old rich guy tends to be like a comfortable Bentley type of experience. Right. Lexus. Yeah. It's a, it's very much a Lexus for, the Lexus formula. I don't like that. And that's what sells cars to people who have that kind of money who are going... It did. To, did. That whole thing, that, there, here's an interesting point. The coupe market is totally dead. A, there are no sports coupes that we can buy anymore as, you know, young enthusiasts. You have oh, you're talking BRZ about, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. You're talking but, about the descendants of like the Integra and right, the, that, the uh, Eclipse, the first and Eclipse. And Prelude and all yeah. of those amazing cars. And then you get to the other end of the spectrum of the luxury sports coupe. Those are gone. I mean, you know, think about how cool a six series was when you were 50 years old, when I was a kid. I mean, that was just like a six series was hot as shit. An eight series was like <laughs> mind blowing. I mean, the, the sort of big luxury or the big sports coupe gone. I mean, yeah. So Bentley does it. Uh, um, that's, I mean, Aston Martin. Yeah. When was the last time you knew of anyone who bought an Aston? I mean, Aston did S class the, the, coupe. Is that a still a thing? The coupe is still a thing, but sedan is, uh, but convertible is dead. I don't, I don't, I think the whole large coupe, I mean, you, you also, we had Camry coupes, we had Lexus SCs. Those are, there's an entire f sort of segment of midsize luxury large coupes that are dead. And I think what happened is sedans got good enough that it used to be that the sedan or SUVs. was SUVs. Well, that fucking ruined everything. I mean, 
I mean, all the, so, so I think that the mentality that used to, correct me if I'm wrong, because I wasn't here, but from watching like the old John Davis things where he's talking about like, Camry, We're glad to have you with us. Camry Coop. He always pronounces it Camry, not Camry. Anyway, Camry Coop, right? The, you would buy a coop if you were like, I don't have any kids. And so I can do the like less practical, more sporty, like form factor. <laughs> Pretty much. And I think that now people are using the, instead of that as being the, like, I'm individualist and I'm going to do the like, practical thing, they're going to say, I'm going to treat myself with an SUV. I'm going to do something different and get an SUV, which is, yeah, of course, what every other damn yeah. person under the sun is doing. But their their idea, if they're sort of of this old-fashioned type of thinking, which is the sedan is the thing to get, or the, the, the sensible, responsible thing, is that in order to indulge their individuality, they're going to get an SUV and think different. That's my hypothesis. I, it's an interesting one. I don't know if it's true. I mean, it was definitely the case back then that the coupe was, you know, like a six series was one number higher than a five series for a reason, but really it was six or seven numbers higher than a five series, right? A five series meant you had to make concessions to real world usability and a six series meant you didn't. You were mm -hmm. that rich. That meant you had a Range Rover that would be broken down on the side of the road, ostensibly there to take your children to school. Um, but and was the same true? Like, the, was that magic rubbing off on people who were buying Accord and Camry coupes? Yeah, probably. They were, you know, the sort of Camry coupe buyer to me was the the fifty something female real estate agent who never really needed to put people in the back seats, but maybe kind of had to. And you know, the, the trunk had to be big enough to for the signs that she would put on. And she walked around and she's like, "I'm fancy. I can have a coupe." Mm. And and so I think that was a that was a thing. It very much was a sign to the world that I don't. I'm I'm unencumbered by <laughs> by the Spawn. reality of the by, but by the realities of the world of having to haul stuff around. But then you you sort of look the other way and you realize that Mercedes E Class wagon customers, when you know a couple of years ago, had like on average 18 cars and were four times more wealthy than Maybach customers. I mean, these were the richest people in the world, and they're like you know. So I don't know. I don't know what what goes into people's thinking. Except it depends that, on the type of money and the the. If you're actually rich, you have an E-Class. And if, if you're you want, wealthy. Yes. If you're wealthy, wealthy you have an E-Wagon. E and if you want to send the image of wealth, then you buy something more conspicuous. E Perhaps, right? yeah. I and mean, you buy an e The funny thing is that they were $80,000 in 1995, which is A 124 insane. e coupe, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the ultimate. That was a wealthy person's car. That was not a rich person's car. Yes. You could, you could buy an E-Class sedan. Think about it this way. The E-Class sedan for what, 40 grand mm -hmm. for a nice one, well-equipped. Yeah. And then that same car with that same three, the E320, same motor as a convertible was what, two and a half times the 83. price? 83. Yeah. I that. remember seeing them on the showroom floor because my mom had a Land Rover and the dealer sold Land Rovers and Mercedes and we were at the dealer getting service a lot. <laughs> in the Land Rover. Yeah, and I remember seeing a black Opal E320 uh, Cabriolet yeah. and it was $83,000. My mom's like, oh, a convertible with four seats. I've got two kids. Perfect. And then we're like, 83 grand. I mean, that was in, that was nearly Bentley money, right? It had to have been. in No, ninety mid-90s. So an S-Class would have been about 90,000 bucks for an S500. Yes. So yeah, it was serious money in 1995. Yeah. Um, and for uh, probably a good comparison is an, a base 993, 911 at that time would have been 60, maybe 65. Holy shit. So $20,000 more. More than a... Base 993. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about in today's in today's value, $130,000, $140,000 for basically what is a $60,000 car with a roof chopped off, which is yes. nuts. Yeah. But it was worth it. Those things were fabulous. Those cars just, I don't know, they don't do that much for me. Station wagon. For a 124, I gotta, it's got to mm. be a station wagon for me or a 500E. But, or you would just say 129 and get an SL, which is what you did. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. But those cars were genuinely expensive. They were hundred thousand dollars at that same time for five hundred. For five hundred, yeah. I kind of wonder if I had to get a one twenty four, what would it be? I never owned a one twenty four. I've had like five two hundred ones. Um, I've had three. Yeah. So you're with two five hundreds, two five hundreds, and a four hundred e. So you've only ever had V twelve, V eight. Only one twenty fours you've ever owned have all left the Porsche factory. Yes. Or visited the Porsche factory in the case of the four hundred e. Yeah. That's crazy. But I would like a wagon. As I I've think talked they're about ugly. Like, no, I, I mean, I care. love them, but I think they're, they're... I just worked on a, a 124T the other day with 382,000 miles on it. And it's signal red. Hmm. It's a red wagon, and we did a, a wiper swap on it because the wiper does the... You know, the old Mercedes wipers get... They're that single thing that's got the cam on it, and they just get slower and slower until it just went... Eh, and that was it. That's all it did. Um, 
what an, a phenomenally well-engineered car. And it looks great in red. I will say it was, it was it's gorgeous in red, but most of them are like white. And then you notice how little the taillights are and like all the magic of the back of the 124 with the, the sort of slash. Oh, of, the envelope. Of, like the envelope, yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess that's the best way to describe it. That's the way the, the way the trunk lid opens just bifurcates the taillights. Apparently that's what they call them in Africa. That's perfect description. But the wagon doesn't have that. Correct. That's kind of the best part of the back of the car. Mm. I'd still have it. Uh, what were we talking about? We went down a rabbit hole and of course sedans. ended up talking about Mercedes. Sedans and how they're not as... We always wind up talking about Mercedes for the 90s. I mean, um, we were talking about how it used to be that a sedan was never going to be a good investment, but coupes were. And that's changed and possibly even inverted yeah i think that's possible i mean ultimately it comes down to what did you want when you were young and if you're of an appropriate age where you, you know you're buying where you you are a, your generation is driving the buying dynamics did you have, okay. did you have posters on your wall as a kid yeah what were they porsches and airplanes i think okay uh did i i never had enough 40 uh Countach maybe uh yes i know you had a 405 on your wall yeah but i just i'm always curious i this came up in a conversation the other day if we were you know wondering what? if kids have posters you, today you know what it's, it's actually for me is that i never wanted to ruin the artifacts by putting it up on the wall and putting holes in it and so i would keep them in tubes and, and on shelves and this is why i have like a huge collection of vintage car brochures now and i would like look at those I don't want to sully the poster by putting holes in it, putting on. I mean, you could have like mounted it and had it framed and you know, I know been that shit's really expensive. bougie. I know. That shit's very expensive. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have. Um, <laughs> there were some actually that, um, as a good compromise, my dad would have mounted on foam core because that was like, you know, reasonable money instead of a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, $3 at the stationery yeah, store. You, you got a glue stick and you, you were put down. it on foam core and then hang it on the wall. And uh, I would I would do that sometimes. Yeah, okay. but. Oh, Jag XK180. Really? Jag XK180 w- together with a D-Type. Okay. That's a strange one. But okay. Yeah. I mean, I had a Buick Riata poster for a while. Okay, that's... F- that that thing was fucking hot as shit. That was Spaceship. Like 1988, whatever it was when that came out. Absolute Spaceship. It was a great looking car. Plus the Riata logo had that like R that had like a little oh, tail so on royal. It. it was very, very regal. Uh-huh. Not a Buick regal, but a Buick Riata um four or five mi 16 other they were i was never into like 205 out of 205 gti poster for some reason that's cool thought gti's uh uh, peugeot's were cool but i don't think i did i had a 944 s2 cab poster i know why a cab i don't get it and every time i've driven a 944 i've almost cried yeah it's better for the people outside of the car than the inside it's just i want the box flares but i want that wretched engine Sorry, it's not a wretched engine. It's a beautiful engine. It's wonderful. The soulless. Wonderful <laughs> soulless. <laughs> Thank you for making me not the evil one here. Um, yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see what the market does because I think, you know, as as we continue to move forward with gas at a million dollars a gallon, I'm curious to see if people are still using older, car, older more inefficient cars. Um, and... Uh, so the the genre to return to this sort of like coupe accessible coupe thing, so that genre was ultimately inherited by, I guess Nissan Altima and Infiniti G thirty five, and then like all that stuff's gone now. I guess BMW still makes the mm. four series, and you can probably get a Q fifty coupe. Q sixty, yeah, it's called a Q sixty. Yeah, is that it's is a Q50 the sedan a Q yeah. fifty? Mm-hmm. Okay, so those are the they same. did the same thing that BMW. everyone. Yeah, everyone followed that where, you know, the, the Audis gain a number to become the coupe of the, of the thing that they are. Okay, so all of those things still exist. Mm-hmm. Um, how did that uh, G35 work out? Heartbreakingly. So my nephew, the, the proudest moment of my unclehood has been that my 18-year-old nephew has sprouted to be a huge car guy. Um, and he decided he wanted a G35 coupe. And not something I've ever wanted. I mean, that's like a like thousand pounds heavier than my heaviest car. Um, but, you know, but for, for an 18 year old, that's a lightweight car um, because everything's gotten so heavy. But anyway, what he wants 35. I mean, 35, 36, 100 pounds, 300, but 300 horsepower. They're, you know, 
the great looking cars. I, I think that back end is one of the most beautiful back ends. But it, it doesn't matter. It was the more the fact that Ant, so another Anthony. I'm surrounded by Anthony's. So Anthony, my nephew, um, wanted a G, was passionately in love with the idea of a G35 coupe. Um, and so I thought the best thing to do is to find him one here on the East Coast. He lives on the East, uh, on the East Coast. Found find one here on the West Coast. Fly him out and immediately put him in a driving school with the car. Um, and Thunderhill Raceway does a. I wish that happened to every person on the road. No oh, shit, really. Seriously, I mean, so he. I mean, first of all, I think every person on the road should be 18 years old and should strive to fly to San Francisco to have an uncle who will put him on a 30% grade in a manual and say, sink or swim, motherfucker, you're going to do it. Um, and he lives somewhere, part of the country that's flat, so he didn't need to really, really have to deal with hills. But my thought was, if he left here and was able to start on, on all these hills, well, then I never have to worry about him anywhere. And he aced it, just absolutely was great. But he went straight from, uh, basically, from the airport to Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving dinner to Thunder Hill Raceway, the teen survival school. And they just do a series of exercises, you know, simple things like full throttle acceleration, full throttle brake, uh, full braking, you know, ABSing, and then add in ABSing around a stationary object like a cone um, or a last second decision where they have to go left or right um, and skid around something. And then, of course, you add in the skid pad and then you add a couple laps, uh, lead follow laps with the instructor. It was an absolutely great time. It was so much fun watching him fall in love with this car and so he falls in love with the g35 here and then then he crewed for our uh, 24 hours of lemons team we had this wonderful time and we drove the g35 cross country which was i never told him this but kind of the scariest thing i've ever done because well two reasons I'm five days in the car with an 18 year old like i don't know if i was gonna have to kill him like you know i haven't spent that much time with him since he's like three the other issue was this is a car with 100 and i don't know 130,000 miles on it how, is it going to make it? And so I went through everything and did a ton of work on it before we left. And all I kept thinking was, don't break down, don't break down, don't break down, don't break down. I mean, it's a long way across from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. It's Japanese. Yeah, but I mean, come on, it's still a 15 year old car. But anyway, we made it. We stopped at the Grand Canyon. We, we stopped in Vegas. I got him fondled by <laughs> some inappropriate people on the side of the road. It was perfect. His mother was going to kill me. And uh, we made it home. Everything's fine. And he has since completely and totally fallen more and more in love with the car, which was exactly what we had hoped would happen, right? We didn't want, you know, I helped him buy the car. He had saved up, you know, for months and months and months working his ass off and didn't quite have enough money to get there. But I pushed him the rest of the way. And the, the deal was, you know, I wanted him to come here and work on the car. And, you know, so he buffed out the paint and we did all the stuff together on it. And the idea was like, fall in love with this car and have something you're attached to kind of backfired because he became a little bit i don't want to say too attached he became far more attached to the to that car than i'd even hoped which is a frankly best case scenario until he was on the road at 245 at night um on the way back from buying an intake manifold for it after he had put an exhaust on it and all these other parts he was of course this is best case scenario right we want him to fall in love with this car um and he had a deer and so that the car's basically the car's totaled because of Nissan's stupid ass design. They put a impact center sensor behind the headlight. The deer hit the headlight, and the headlight hit the impact sensor, which fired the airbags and the seatbelt pretensioners, which means six thousand dollars worth of damage just in airbags and pretensioners. Pyrotechnics. So that pushed the damage on the car, which is otherwise minor, over to the total uh, amount. So this was you know, a fight, a bit of a fight with the insurance company to, to make sure that we were going to get the car back and we got enough out of them to really fix it and put it back on the road. And so it's currently in the shop being repaired. Um, and the best part of this was he was like, you know, it's not best. The, the good news that came out of the bad news was he was like, I don't want another car. I want this. And my sister was like, well, here's a G35 sedan. And he was like, fuck no. Not, in the way that an 18 year old say, would say similar to his mother, but not using the fuck no word. Um, and I mean, I've met your family. I don't never know. Oh, uh, no, isn't yeah, you would have. No, you know what? I never cursed in front of my mother ever. I fell down a flight of stairs when I was seven, I think I was seven. Um, and I said, Crap, when I hit the bottom, I stood up and got cracked across the face. We never cursed in my house, which is fucking why I fucking curse like fucking this now. See, huh. how about now with your mother? Oh, like a sailor. Yeah, we, we she's making up for lost time too. I mean, <laughs> she she had to not curse for, you know, the, the first 18 years of my life either. 
Um, but anyway, yeah, this is the car that he wanted. It was exactly a, you know, 2006 G35 with the rev up motor and rear active steer and blah, 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 blah. Um, and so sadly it has been injured, but the good news is it'll be back on the road. It's well, and the fixed. moral of that story presumably is that he had the familiarity with the car to not make it worse by, yeah. for example, trying something evasive that wasn't, he had two friends in the car. It's two forty five in the morning. You just know that's when things turn bad. And so even though the deer died, sorry for Bambi, emphasis on the BAM part of Bambi. Um, <laughs> so bad. Um, sorry for Bambi, but look, the kids are uninjured. The car is fine. The most important thing is that they were all okay. Um, and, you know, he was just despondent. He's like, I only had this car for a couple months. This is this really sucks. And I'm like, no, this doesn't really suck. The deer could have come flying through the window and hurt you guys. You could have swerved to avoid the deer and hit a tree and it could have been very badly like it, it could have ended so many different ways but he i would like to think or i'd like to hope that at least the school didn't hurt i mean i think that's um, an important aspect of becoming a good car enthusiast i always worry about this i come across people with some regularity who like cars but maybe haven't invested enough in themselves to be good operators oh you mean the people that um track days and ferrari like scuderias that get lapped by people in miatas that are running on three cylinders with ball tires i mean at least the people are out there and ferrari's trying to learn how to drive for every one of those guys who's out at the track there's a bunch of guys who are out there learning uh these lessons on their way into curbs leaving cars and coffee uh, i mean where would we be why would the internet exist if not to show us pictures of stupid people on Teslas driving entire, like jumping entire blocks or guys leaving cars and coffee and hitting pedestrians in the way? Come on. Is, that, is just, it only me I've, that derives my pleasure from? <laughs> I mean, yes, there's definitely an element of schadenfreude to all of that, but it's something that I think that every enthusiast should take upon themselves to, instead of buying mods, maybe do the driver mod, which is to go through a process like your nephew did of actually learning how to operate a freaking car. Uh, there's so much, I mean, I don't know. What was your process like? I think we have a whole other episode on this. I think we have you know, our the, next the episode. long and colorful story. Of no, 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 not on me, but the, 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 the process of becoming a good enthusiast. I think there's a lot of points that we can make and we can complain and be curmudgeonly and tell people that they're doing it wrong, which is frankly our favorite thing to do um, and judge them harshly. Let's do that. As it should be. I mean, 100% agree. Okay. So next episode is, now I've signed us up for this. Next episode, we're going to start to finish how to become a proper automotive enthusiast. Yes. In the world I hope that there's a color, colorful story involving, I don't know. Cra me crashing a car when I was 18 or something? Something like that, yeah. We're going to have to dig up pictures of this shit. <laughs> you all know the worst part of this whole thing is that we have to, every time we talk about something, we have to go searching through archives of hard drives and finding photos. Hyphen over here is like, oh, hold on. That was uh, August 31st, 1977. And it, the crew's laughing over there because this is exactly what you do. And you're like, I was wearing a red jacket. And what? Oh, yes. Oh, it's right here. Here's the photo. Yeah. Me, on the other hand, I'm like, you know, I'm really good. I'm like, oh, everything's in the, on the cloud and I can find everything like that. Do I even know what fucking decade it happened in? No. But you know the date. Like within a few days. Okay. What is the first day that I ever drove a Ferrari 308 GT4? Uh, February 28th, 2016. Pull it up. Pull it up. I don't understand how you know this. February 28th, oh. 2016. Okay, so he showed up at my house. I think we've talked about this before, so I'll say it briefly. He showed up at my house for a barbecue, and he showed up a couple hours earlier than everyone else in an ivory ferrari 308 gt4 and my line was what'd you go and buy that ugly ferrari for uh he then handed me the keys and was like that's why I drive it and find out and i drove it and offered it uh to purchase motherfucker february 28th 2016 3 48 p.m but there are other people there what you're gonna have to you're gonna have to sh screen grab that in 12 17 12 17. before anyone else had arrived i can't how how do you know this i don't know I honestly genuinely would not have known what year it is. I didn't even know what, when I bought it from you. Because it was like three years later, right? It was 20, 20, 2018. Hold on. This was 16. I was only two years? June of... I well, was Because I had already owned the car. 
for some time before you drove it. Okay. So yeah, took you almost three years to sell it to me. Fucking bastard. You're welcome. It's now the car you were most re- second most reluctant to sell. This yeah, might continued know. efforts on my part. Like the 288 GTO, it is the, the, it's the, those are the only two Ferraris that have ever lived up to my expectations in terms of how they drive. That well, your expectations were very low for the 308, to no, be fair. No, no, it actually hits all the expectations. Okay, I might have been, they might have been low be- to for that. you, right, what are you doing with that shit box? Was that what I said? I, I don't know. Shitty, shitty old, I think I was shitty white, ugly Ferrari, whatever the fuck I said. My expectations for a Ferrari and it, were very high, but my expectations for a 308 GTB and a GTS are, were unbelievably high because of how beautiful those cars are, and they are not good to drive at all and so that this car surpassed even the expectations of the of the pretty 308s and everybody who owns those cars knows that if they've driven enough of the cars ferrari told me that ferrari's people people in italy they're like don't tell anyone but these are the better the best driving 308s i'm like i've told everyone already yes <laughs> there's no 100 percent true yeah. and the thing that it makes it drive so great is that it drives a lot like a 246 with a different motor never driven a 246 you have to i mean it'll feel very familiar to you except it's got a v6 yeah. You know, we did a whole episode on how I hate V6s. I mean, I like them. I just like the noise. You're an asshole. But I did. I will say, I've heard the noise of those things. And oh my God, they sound good. Yeah. Plus, I will happily drive one, one Ferrari. Hey, Ferrari, give me a 246 new one. Uh, the, the, what's the new one? Yeah, 246. Oh, 296. 296. 290, that, that sounded 296. I, wanted two, I really want to drive a 296. So maybe 120 degree splay angle will change my uh, opinion of V6s. Or not i mean yeah do you mind them when they're 180 degrees that's not a v6 i guess it's it's a 911. yeah yeah totally different thing okay so uh go back and we'll study how to become a proper enthusiast and we'll see if we can't scare you up at 296 from ferrari <laughs> please uh all right so don't forget to like and subscribe as we're supposed to say that no no one cares bye